Hey there, students. Tom Ritchie here for a bit of a push review. Okay, so uh, we've got here uh, P underscore Diddy 56 says, did it for AP Euro last year, a push this year. Let's go. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, remember I'm here on Monday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern for a push review. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to click the link to join us in Crowdcast because that's going to put you on the list to receive updates um, as far as, you know, you'll get reminded when I'm going live. There will be as we get closer to the exam, other sessions going on beyond what we're seeing on these Monday evening sessions. So make sure that you join that. Some of y'all are already over here. Miss Skinner and her students are here 24 days to go until the paper pencil exam. So we want to make sure that that is uh, uh, going. Now, a few things before we get started. I want to remind everybody that I'm out here at 9 o'clock p.m. Uh, on every Monday night between now and the exam. Um, but we also want to note that Marco Learning is offering student support. If you are uh, if you are in uh, YouTube, it's in the video description. If you're in Crowdcast, I'm about to put this there. Now, not only for a push, but for several sessions. Okay, these are premium sessions. These are 90-minute sessions each week, and they go deep into skills and also making sure that, you know, you have your questions answered. Okay. So these are, you know, we've got this for eight subjects. So this is another great way to prepare. Again, I've got these free public hangouts um, on every Monday evening. Now, also, I want to give a quick shout out to Mr. Terry History. Um, he dropped by the previous broadcast. I was familiar with his work. I was like, hey, hey, Mr. Terry. And so with that, I just want to give a quick shout out to another history teacher that's really putting out some entertaining content. Um, he's even got a gaming channel, it looks like. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to drop links for Mr. Terry History and also for Marco Learning Student Support um, in the chat. Okay, so go ahead and uh, make sure um, to check those out. Those are great opportunities, uh, you know, one for if you're preparing for AP exams, another one if you are a big fan of history and just like the subject. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and let's think about... Um, Okay, access to previous sessions, they are recorded and they are on my YouTube channel. So if you want to go um, through my YouTube channel, just go to my YouTube channel, then go to videos and you'll see that the previous sessions are on my YouTube channel. So you'll be able to see that. Thanks for the question, Maya. Okay, so we are focusing on the so-called Unit 4, 1800 to 1848. Okay, so we're going to be putting that out there. And, uh, you know, I think it's great. Uh, you know, Raul is actually a teacher, so he's also got good, always got good questions. We're going to put that, uh, we're going to be, be there in just a little bit. Now, remember to upvote questions. Okay, one of the things you can do, it's not just asking questions, but going to ask a question and upvoting questions you like to make sure that the questions that I'm answering are the ones that are, uh, you know, that are being answered. Yeah. So as far as that goes, uh, you know, the, this, I don't know if I have a quote unquote cheat sheet for unit four, but yes, as far as that goes, just like Raul said, uh, we are looking at whether you're taking it in person or online. Um, this is going to be a much different exam than that exam last year. Wow. What a joke. All right. So with this judicial review. Okay. So one of the things that we're going to note is that the Jeffersonians in 1800, the Jeffersonians, I like to call them Jeffersonian Republicans, the exam, um, this redesigned exam often refers to them as quote unquote democratic republicans with a hyphen there whatever you want to call them as long as it's clear um so the jeffersonians they win the election of 1800 in what jefferson calls the revolution of 1800 now the jeffersonians did a few things first of all they cut taxes and spending okay jefferson in his second inaugural address he mentions that we have cut we have completely obliterated all internal taxes okay so jefferson has gone through the expenditures of the federal government and he realized that like hamilton's whiskey tax and some other taxes like that they were costing as much to collect as they were bringing in revenue 
And Jack and Jefferson's like, you know what? If this is the case, I mean, taxation is theft. Um, keep in mind that, you know, when he says a wise and frugal government, Jefferson says that the government has a responsibility not to spend wastefully. You know, I don't see Jefferson like saying like, hey, every man, woman and child, 1400 bucks here, go buy whatever you want, uh, you know, regardless of your, uh, you know, of your financial need. For example, I got a $1,400 check. I have a job. Okay. And, uh, you know, also I know all of y'all are watching the ads when y'all look at the YouTube videos, you know, it's like our government, uh, you know, while, you know, some people are helped by some of these measures, our government today has a lot of wasteful spending. Jefferson's getting rid of all of that. So, you know, he's cutting spending, he's getting rid of internal taxes. So that's something that we could say that Jefferson is as Richard Hofstetter writes, the historian, he has trimmed the edges off of federalism because on one hand, there are meaningful reductions to taxes and spending. Now, on the other hand, uh, the neutrality policy, which Jefferson wasn't a great big fan of, you know, during Washington's tenure, Jefferson with the embargo, oh, this cursed oh, grab me. Uh, that Jefferson's embargo was rooted in his commitment as president. Now, remember, the presidency gives you a different vantage point on his commitment to the principle of neutrality. So foreign policy does not really change significantly with Jefferson. Now, it does in the sense that if we're thinking about a change, a major change in Jefferson's time is the Louisiana Purchase, that Jefferson basically doubles the size of the United States, okay? And also, he, uh, you know, is going to limit the influence of New England, okay? That's something that we see there. Now, also, just note, I'm going to be doing Instagram shout outs, okay? So if I've got new Instagram followers during this broadcast, I will be doing shout outs. Remember to also follow my friends at Marco Learning. So at Tom Ritchie, at Marco Learning. Marco Learning's got a lot of great updates about AP exams in general. That's where I'm going to figure out, like, what is it about this exam or that exam? You know, as a teacher, I'm concerned about content, but Marco Learning is putting out general exam updates. So, the neutrality policy, um, you know, foreign policy besides the Louisiana Purchase, you know, that sort of thing. Now, remember, Jackson declared war on the bank. OK, he said the bank's trying to kill me. I'm going to kill it. Now, when Jefferson gets into office, Jefferson, uh, you know, does not try to immediately destroy the Bank of the United States. Jefferson sees that the bank has a 20 year charter. He's got every intention of letting the bank function until then. Now, one of the biggest things we see, though, is while the Jeffersonians have control over the elected branches. OK, um, so when they have control over the elected branches, the Federalists um, in early 18. 1800, they passed the Judiciary or 1801, the Judiciary Act of 1801, the so-called Midnight Judges Act. So the clock is about to strike midnight. Um, it's a similar situation to right now that you you hear some some Democrats like right now the Democrats are in control of the elected branches of the federal government, and the Republicans have a six three majority on the Supreme Court. So there is talk about you know using Congress's power to add more federal judges. Now I don't necessarily see this happening. Um, but in 1801, this did happen. And so there were some things as far as the Federalists maintain control of the judiciary throughout Jefferson and Madison's tenure. And so John Marshall, uh, you know, John Adams goes to his secretary of state, John Marshall, and it's like, how would you like a seat, uh, you know, as chief justice of the Supreme Court? After all, you're about to be unemployed. John Marshall's like, sure. And so in Marbury v. Madison, John Marshall uh, you know, is, uh, you know, is advancing the idea of judicial review. Now, judicial review is nowhere in the Constitution. Does it say point blank that the Supreme Court will interpret this document? OK, that the Supreme Court will interpret this document and gets to say what's constitutional and what's not. Um, and after all, Andrew Jackson believed that the president had the job to do that, that everybody has the job to interpret the Constitution. Um, you know, of course, Jefferson believed that the states have the right to interpret the Constitution. That's what he wrote in the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. So judicial review is 
John Marshall's doctrine that the Supreme Court of the United States has the authority to interpret the Constitution and decide what it says and what laws are in line with it and what laws are in conflict with it. So that all goes in Marbury v. Madison. But remember the Federalist control of the judiciary. OK, so uh, let me go ahead and uh, Golden D, Lindsay Bernard, um, Kapla Lot, GXO, Vicky Huang, um, J.S. Ely, um, Guiding Guardians, uh, F.D. Pasia, Maya Ragab. OK, thank you all so much. Uh, and if I mispronounced anything, y'all just uh, please, uh, please forgive me um, as I forgive you. Now, of course, if you make a one, I'm probably not going to forgive you. But if you make a two, I'll, I'll forgive you. OK, um, you know, ones are just so hard to forgive sometimes. So, yeah, Marbury v. Madison Judicial Review. All right. And uh, Raul, do you want to? Uh, yeah, we got some AP government. Yeah. Marbury B. Madison is going to come up. Um, Raul, do you want to come on camera for a little bit? You've come on camera before. Let me know if you want to uh, drop in and we'll uh, we'll address your question here. Thinking about like Jeffersonian democracy, Jacksonian democracy. Let me know if you're interested and I'll invite you on uh, on camera. And so. The Jackson presidency. OK, so when we think about this uh, Jacksonian democracy. And this is one of those things. Jackson is kind of a controversial figure. Like, you know, on one hand, uh, President Trump had a portrait of Jackson hanging in the Oval Office. On the other hand, Jackson is about to be taken off of the twenty dollar bill, I believe, in favor of Harriet Tubman. Uh, Jackson was somebody who really defined an age when you think about it. They call this the age of Jackson. Jackson. Now he gets blamed for a lot of things that, you know, he's really just kind of going with the times, you know, that when you think about Jackson, it's like, okay, Jacksonian democracy certainly was not something that included, uh, you know, included women, um, that included non-whites. But now the thing is, what we have to think of is when we look at the progress of American democracy, um, and Jackson did not create this himself, but what we want to note is before the 1820s, before this time where Jackson comes onto the scene, um, you don't, uh, you no, not every white man can vote. OK, so you have basically votes are determined by property ownership, like the ability to participate in our government is partially determined by property ownership. You know, y'all remember Mr. Terry history who dropped by earlier Marco student support. OK, remember that as uh, remember that as well. And I believe I paid my water bill. I'm trying to close some tabs um, to make sure that we've got, uh, you know, got some things here. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we will uh, you know, we'll go on here. So the age of Jackson. OK, so table of contents. Uh, you know, we see Jacksonian democracy. Yeah, we don't need a table of contents. But what I want to note here is direct balloting for president. OK, now Jackson didn't invent this. OK, this is something that comes of age in the 1820s, that the old system of indirect balloting, OK, the old system of indirect balloting voters of at least the property owning voters, they vote for the members of their state legislature. The state legislators vote for presidential electors who vote for the president. Now, even today, um, as Raul can testify, who teaches AP government, we do not cast votes directly for president or vice president. When we vote for president, we are actually voting in one of 51 distinct election. So we have a federal election, not a national election. So voters, even though the voting machines tend to just say the name of the president, vice president, you're actually directly electing presidential electors. So what they've done here is in the 1820s, we see that the state legislature, this additional layer is taking out, taken out. And we have this new system where people are voting directly. And so what we see here is the government is, uh, you know, is becoming more directly responsible to the people that the, you know, the framers of the Constitution, they didn't want a democracy. They wanted a mixed government with elements of democracy. And so uh, this is something that we see a transition here to a presidency that is more accessible. And again, Jackson's just the guy that happens to be there. Jackson is not a political theorist or anything like that. Uh, you know, he's just somebody who just happens to be the man for his time. Um, so by 1836, every state except for my home state of South Carolina 
is casting direct ballots for presidential electors. And so that's something here that we'll notice that in 1824. Now, this is the time where you'd had the period of the era of good feelings, you know, basically this time between the first and the second party system. Okay, so as far as that goes, we can kind of see why we have political parties. Um, is, you know, as far as that goes, we have political parties because it makes it a little bit easier. Um, and so with this, uh, you know, we see basically four sectional candidates running for president. Now, in this 1824 election, Jackson does not get the majority of the electoral votes, but he gets a plurality. And also, when we look at the popular vote, we see that he got more popular votes. This doesn't legally count, but it's still worth looking at. Uh, now, notice only about 350,000 popular votes cast. This is going to be in the millions by the 1830s, okay? So we see during this time between 1824 and 1840, we see this maturing of American democracy where presidential elections become, you know, popular contests. So what happens here is this has to go to the House. Now, note here, you take the top three. So, you know, it's going to be um, Andrew Jackson, uh, William Crawford, and John Quincy Adams. Now, note here Henry Clay, who is from the West and also the Speaker of the House at the time. When we look at the House vote, oh, all of Clay's votes naturally, you know, just uh, just naturally went to John Quincy Adams. And how about that? Now, granted, they were kind of close in their, you know, platforms and stuff like that. Remember Henry Clay on the American system, NIP. National Bank, Internal Improvements, Protective Tariff. Um, you know, Adams was the closest. They both thought we've got to shut down Jackson. Now, what happens here, though, is something that they thought at the time it wasn't going to be that bad necessarily because I've got a video, one of the videos that I wish, like when people ask, like, what's one of your videos that you wish more people would watch? Um, it's a video called Aristocratic Republics and Democratic Republics. It's not something that directly addresses like content for this exam, but it helps you to understand, okay? In an aristocratic republic, you expect a bit of uh, deal making. OK, that there are deals made between elites uh, that, you know, basically John Quincy Adams becomes president and Henry Clay, who helped deliver the presidency to him, becomes secretary of state. Now, in a democracy, you wouldn't do this. It looks stupid. It looks corrupt. You just you just would not. But in this case, uh, you know, they didn't really see democracy happening. And so Andrew Jackson and Calhoun, actually, uh, you know, the vice president for John Quincy Adams, you know, they see here that Henry Clay, by being made secretary of state in this aristocratic republic with the Virginia dynasty, it's like the secretary of state kind of becomes the heir apparent. And so by doing this, John Quincy Adams is like, look, I'm going to do two terms. I'm passing on to you. Tag, you're it. Now, enter democracy. And that's something that's going to uh, going to be a little bit different. I still haven't cleared the clip art from this old presentation here. Um, but, um, you know, Jacksonian democracy is, uh, you know, partly the belief in the common man, that the common man can participate in government. Remember Hamilton and the Federalists, they're like, oh, goodness, we don't want, uh, you know, common people participating in government. And so, you know, universal white male suffrage. Now, again, um, it's, you know, we can use presentism to look back at Andrew Jackson and say like, well, you know, he didn't do enough for, you know, he didn't advocate for suffrage for women. Uh, you know, he was not, uh, you know, he was not good to minorities. Um, but at the same time, it's overall progress. So there are two ways that we can look at this. You know, I tend to look at history through the context of that time. And I see this as a time where, you know, you definitely see a movement from aristocracy to democracy. So if you're a fan of everyone having voting rights, this was a necessary step. Now, another thing we see here is the beginning of popular campaigning. So today, when we look at all of the money that is spent and all of the the, you know, just all of the energy that is spent in popular campaigning, this was not really a thing before the 1820s, before Jackson becomes a popular candidate. So that's something that we're seeing uh, that we're seeing there. So that is, uh, you know, a bit 
um, of Jacksonian democracy. Now, this is something, and yes, uh, you know, so Raul, I'm going to go ahead and invite you on screen here, and let's talk about, Je you know, because Jefferson was someone who, you know, by the standards of its time, believed in some sort of democracy or more popular participation. But at the same time, he was not so much like a populist. Now, remember, we've got like large P populism in the 1890s. Populism, small P, is any kind of government or any kind of politician or political movement that caters to the masses and not necessarily like in a good way, like the populist party in the 1890s. It's like, you know, it sounds great. Well, let's just let the government take over the railroads. You know, there's a little bit, a uh, little bit more to it than that. So uh, Raul, what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, and feel free to shout out to your school or your kids or uh, whatever, but let's hear a little like bit of comparison between Jefferson and Jackson. Yeah, um, so that's one of the things that my, uh, my class uh, looked at way back in i can't remember it was like maybe october november we got to this uh time frame in in uh in history we have a year-long uh class up here at uh, west york area high school in uh, york pennsylvania and um and a shout out to uh, mrs skinner's uh, students and uh, all the students on, on here uh, i can definitely attest that uh tom ritchie uh, helped my students out on uh, the on the uh, A push test uh, last year, so um, so Tom, I thank you for for all your work there. Appreciate your support. No problem. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here. Let me just make sure. Um, oh, that's not it. Oh, there it is. Okay, so this is a, a document that I shared with um, my classes, uh, and I'm Tom. Did you? Did, did I get this from you or? You know, I wonder, um, you know, I'm not uh, not exactly uh, exactly sure there. But if you want, uh, if you you can either project that there or if you're fine with uh, the audience looking at it, feel free to put the link um, in the uh, in the chat if you want to, you know, just give them like viewing access. But either way, I'll see what I can. What okay, and do, also um, if you just if you'll just like control plus a few times so that we can look at you know so that we can see it a little bit bigger on the screen. Okay, so notice what we're doing here, and this is something that's very important that we see that um you know when we compare we think about the similarities and then we think about the differences here. So let's go in first into the similarities we've got here. So you take a look at what Jap what Jefferson and Jackson uh, did. Um, Jefferson really is a very strong states' rights. Uh, wants to, um, you know, make sure that the national government is not intrusive as to what states' rights should it should do or, or things like that. Um, the uh, the fact that it was too controlling, and you can see this with the bullet point there. I believe the strong central government was the enemy of individual liberty. Uh, you know, this is part of the American. Uh, Creed from the 1917s uh, speech by, uh, I just, uh, I think it's William Taylor, uh, William Taylor or something like that, uh, about a strong belief in individualism. Um, one of the national debt paid and, and loans avoided, uh, believe that the uh, a strict construction of the Constitution, the, um, the fact that the uh, you know the, the government should be limited in what it can do to only what's uh, written in the constitution uh a very agrarian based um uh what i want to say constituency uh for for this and that's one of the biggest uh things there um also had uh, you know little regard for the rights and culture of, of native americans the fact that you know they were kind of in, this is and this is uh predating uh, manifest destiny uh, the fact that we were the ones in control of the um, of the continent, and uh, I think in a couple, if you uh, study the um, Lewis and Clark um, expedition, uh, they are actually going to uh, ask um, Lewis and Clark to uh, are going to ask the Native American uh, tribal chiefs to go visit the their new father. So they refer to Thomas Jefferson as as the father of the. Um, 
of, of the continent. So those are some of the things that they had, uh, you know, sim similarities. Uh, if you're going to compare Jefferson Jackson, uh, maybe on an LEQ or a DBQ, uh, I'm not sure if it, do they do that for um, the short answer questions. Um, you know, it, it, you could see that really about uh, about anywhere. Now, if you know, an LEQ would probably word it a little bit more vaguely. Um, mm -hmm. I would think that like, you know, compare that, uh, you know, I wonder if they would go so far as like Jefferson and Jackson, but probably a little more vague. But definitely as far as this political culture, like, you know, a lot of times I'll refer to Richard Hofstetter's The American Political Tradition. And he'll note here that, you know, a lot of their platforms are the same, you know, as Raul said saying, you know, we've got states' rights, we've got, uh, you know, the farmers or, you know, they're advocating for them. And, you know, Jefferson, there was a uh, there was a Virginia draft constitution that Jefferson actually said, wait, wait, I think there's like a little bit too much popular representation. You know, there was a plan that allowed both houses to be directly popularly elected where Jefferson's like, whoa, that's a little bit, you know, Jefferson was a fan of balanced government. And, uh, you know, Jefferson would refer sometimes to the idea of a natural aristocracy. So, you know, Jackson's kind of a man like, for the people, whereas Jackson's kind of, you know, coming out as a man of the people. So when we go into these differences, it's a lot, you know, they've got the same constituencies behind them. They are both advocating for states' rights, laissez-faire. Um, they're both against the bank, even though Jackson's like, woo. Um, also, I would say that there's a bit of resistance and tension between them and the Supreme Court, um, where Jackson's the one who says, you know, John Marshall's made his decision, now let him enforce it. Uh, so both of them have those, uh, you know, those run-ins there. So where do we sit? Yeah, as we as we scroll through here, let's uh, mm -hmm. highlight a few uh, a few of these differences here. Yeah. Um, so Jefferson, if you you combine like these uh, like these first three things, uh, I know in another AP Gov reference we take a look at uh, different models of democracy, whether it's a uh, participatory democracy, a pluralist democracy, or an elite democracy. Uh, this is actually an elite kind of viewpoint for uh, for Jefferson, where the um, the those in some type of elite status, whether it's by wealth, whether it's by power, they're the ones that should, you know, kind of control the decision making. Whereas Jackson is going to kind of represent this, you know, participatory democracy. Uh, the you know, getting more and more people engaged in the political process. So you can see the fact that, you know, gentleman farmer, those with large plantations, whether the, uh, Jackson was the dirt farmer. Um, and, and again, this is uh, probably the strongest uh, thing about this. Uh, the, the Anyone can hold office, government by the people. Uh, the, big, the biggest change were, were the states, especially the Western states, allowing for uh, dropping the property requirement and the um, the church going requirement for uh, people in order to vote. So this is, um, you know, some of the biggest differences uh, because they did exist, uh, you know, in a, a different generations. Um, Jefferson is uh, going to promote agriculture interests. Uh, Jackson is uh, also is going to be um, around during the uh, 18 you know, 1828 to 1836 he's going to oversee an an emerging uh industrial society so that's going to be one of the things that he can't um is going to be very different between the two of them you know, that's I think this is interesting, too, where you see that Jackson, you know, does understand this new like industrial reality, you know, where, you know, Jefferson, I guess, from retirement could kind of see that we're going to have to have some industry. Um, but mm -hmm. Jackson, yeah, when we think about the nullification crisis, you know, Jackson really. Um, tried to walk this like central line talking about a judicious tariff, you know, so he wanted to make sure he's he knows that the northern wing of the Democratic Party, they favor protective tariffs. So when Jackson, you know, is talking about tariff policy, he realizes like we've got to balance 
um, the interest of those, uh, you know, of those sections there. And so as far as that, uh, you know, as far as that goes, Raul, if you figure out how to, uh, you know, if you if you feel comfortable later, you know, at any point, like sharing this with the audience, I'm sure they'd like to take, uh, you know, to take a look at it. And uh, and thanks. I, I appreciate you and your students dropping in on these things. And, uh, you know, it's always good to have y'all. And uh, Vicky, if you ever want to come online, let me uh, let me know. See you guys. All right. Thanks, Raul. All right. So uh, so with that, you know, a good comparison. So understand that sometimes the exam is not just going to stay in one place that it will actually say, like, what about the early part of this, the later part of this? Um, so going from there, um, you know, I will, uh, you know, I will work harder. Amanda, I will work harder. If you've ever seen Animal Farm, you know, do I have cheat sheets, handouts for this unit? Um, thanks. I will work harder. OK, so now one thing. Yeah. So with that, I will work harder. Um, so the different ideologies between the Democratic Republicans and the Federalists. Now, one thing that I want to note here, now that's technically going to be unit three there, but as you know, let me actually, given that we're in unit four, let me go through the second, you know, so you've got the first party system. I believe, you know what, we might not have gotten into that last time. That might have been one thing that we might have left out um, because we were focusing probably a little bit more on the American Revolution and the Constitution. So this would be a good idea just to go into the development of the party system and let me just run in here and share my screen with y'all again here and all right so let's uh let's go ahead and have a look so the first two party systems 1791 to 1860 through the war of 1812 you've got the federalist party um then the republican party which i prefer to refer for, refer to as jeffersonian um the exam is more likely to use democratic republican party um typically you know historians have used this designation this is more of a political science designation but for whatever reason a push uh you know has been gravitating toward this so, you know, let the, you know, I'll make sure you know what the exam says, but anytime I say the Jeffersonians or the Jeffersonian Republicans, that's what I'm talking about. And so the first two party system, you've got the Jeffersonians who are believers in states' rights. Now, one thing that I want to note is don't call the Jeffersonian Republicans just, oh, well, basically they're just the anti-federalists. Because remember that James Madison was one of the writers of the Federalist Papers, that James, you know, while Jefferson was a a big states rights guy, uh, Madison believed in a balance between the central government and the states, whereas he sees Hamilton use, trying to use the Constitution to get whatever authority for the central government he can, whereas Madison views the Constitution, like Jefferson, as a compact, a contract between the states. And so Madison is, excuse me, is against what Hamilton's doing because he sees that Hamilton is trying to consolidate power. This is a guy that said uh, at the Constitutional Convention, why don't we just get rid of the states as sovereign entities? Um, so with that, you know, no cap. I mean, that's, uh, you know, Hamilton was saying like, you know, I don't think the state should have any rights at all. But that was in a private meeting and that didn't come out until, you know, Madison published his notes after everybody else was dead. Now, as far as the fears, you know, that the Federalists are afraid of, afraid of anarchy and mob rule, whereas the Jeffersonians are afraid of tyrannical government, government that is going, uh, that is going to, too far in restricting the liberties of the people. Jefferson wrote, uh, you know, at the time that the Constitution was being considered, he said, I am no friend of energetic government. I think it is always oppressive. Um, the Constitution, loose construction, probably the only time I will ever use Comic Sans, loose construction, whereas Jefferson, strict construction. Now, loose construction says that there are implied powers, okay? So we have the loose construction, whereas Jeffersonian strict construction, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, this is something that Jefferson says, the enumerated powers only. Now, while Jefferson does purchase Louisiana using the treaty making power. Um, Jefferson would kind of made his own problem. I think that the jump from the treaty making power to purchasing land by treaty, by treaty, okay, it's, it's not nearly as much of a jump as Hamilton's jump to like, oh, you know what? The government can tax. Uh, the government can print money. The government can borrow money. National Bank, 
that would help with that. There we go. Um, we have that power. That is loose construction, the doctrine of implied powers, whereas Jefferson says the Constitution, it is an agreement. It is a compact between the states. Um, their support base. Now, just like Jackson. Now, note here, Jackson, like Jefferson, is a strict constructionist, a states' rights guy. Um, Jackson is also, he tends to be laissez-faire. Um, so the National Bank, very yes, Jefferson very much against it. Okay, so we see here protective tariffs, federal assumption of state war debts. Now remember in foreign policy, Hamilton's much more likely to favor the British, Jefferson, the French. Now y'all were asking me about some handouts like last time. I do have something in my Google Drive. Okay? Okay, um, let me note here uh, that I've got something here. Let's see what I what I would have here. Um, that um, I'm going to run in here real quick here. War of 1812. Okay, so let me go ahead and uh, let me go ahead and just open this one. And I'm going to uh, to go. I'm going to open something here that goes into like continuity and change with the War of 1812. Um, and then it goes into a uh, you know it goes into a comparison here of, uh, you know, some things as far as the American system, okay? Henry Clay's American system is one of the things that I'll drive home here. Um, and y'all are welcome to take from this. This is just a tutoring sheet that I used for a session um, on Google Drive, okay? So that's something that'll be helpful. Those of you on the Crowdcast, y'all have got a link now. So with that, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, you know, at Jackson, okay? Now you'll note here when we look at Jackson versus Clay, the second party system. So we had the Federalist and the Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans. Then you had the era of good feeling. And then you have the, you know, this Republican party splits into the National Republicans, uh, the Democratic Republicans. And finally in the 1830s, it's Whigs versus the Democrats. And Whigs picking their name because they say that Andrew Jackson governs like a king. I don't know if I have that cartoon in there somewhere. But with that, um, you know, just going in here that you see that like Jefferson, um, Jackson is a state's rights guy. The Whigs tend to be more elitist, whereas Jackson is more democratic. The common, the common man should have a role in government. Uh, Whigs are more likely to support moral reforms like temperance, abolitionism, Democrats not so much. Strict constructionist, laissez-faire, loose construction. Um, in the economy, Hamilton believed in government economic development, whereas Jackson tended to be more on the laissez-faire side. Now, the American system um, that, uh, you know, when you look at the National Bank, internal improvements, basically federally funded infrastructure projects, um, you see here that, uh, you know, that Jackson is against these things. Clay is for the American system. And then the protective tariff, Jackson's kind of like yes and no, depending on where the Democrats are from. Northern Democrats, they like that sort of thing. Southern Democrats, not so much. Okay, so going from there, let me just show you what I've got here. Some of y'all, you know, logged in here on the Google Drive um, where pre-1812, post-1812. Now, although the War of 1812 does shift the U.S. economy a little bit, um, you know, it doesn't uh, change the reality that cash crop agriculture and foreign trade continued to drive the United States economy for decades after the War of 1812. And let me just do a few more Instagram uh, shout outs. We've got uh, Corey um, Champagne. Um, Sensari and then uh, Sophia um, Udell, which uh, Sophia it looks like you actually are an active Instagram user. My goodness, like most of the accounts that follow me are like, you know, hey, I'm on Instagram, I got no post. Um, so uh, Sophia, the most recent follower here, will go ahead and uh, yeah, that's uh, you know actually an active Instagram user. We'll go ahead and do a uh, follow back for like actively using the platform. It's just uh, it's it's just somebody's got to show me like why you know people make the accounts. I don't know. I don't know. Um, so with that, uh, you know, so pre-1812, looking that, you know, first of all, the United States gives up its ambitions to take over Canada, whereas the United States post-1812, no longer trying to take over Canada. Um, so with this, uh, you know, before the War of 1812, that the U.S. economy is 
focusing on trading raw materials for finished products from Europe as the factories, you know, European, you know, or Europeans are basically producing goods that we're not producing. Now, as far as that goes, the War of 1812 showed us that the Jeffersonian economic model, okay? So when we're looking at the Jeffersonian economic model, that's AP Euro, wrong subject there. Um, but let's go in here and let's see, go into the age of Jackson and get into Henry Clay's American system. Actually, you know what? I think that I've got that over here. All right, so Henry Clay's American system. What we want to understand here is according to the Jeffersonian economic model, you've got the, uh, the system of raw materials and finished goods. And in order for this to happen, remember Jefferson said, we don't want any manufacturing. That was one of his uh, beasts with Hamilton. We don't want any manufacturing. Now, the War of 1812 happens and we realize we can't always count on trade. So Henry Clay's American system, which I always refer to as NIP, don't refer to it as PEN because PEN could be P-E-N. So NIP, um, that we have the National Bank, Internal Improvements, Protective Tariff. So before the War of 1812, the first bank of the United States is chartered, it's fired. Um, then, uh, you know, we see internal improvements such as the infrastructure and then the protective tariff. So very Hamiltonian and the goals being self-sufficiency, developing internal trade, developing Western lands. Now, what we want to note here is the American system, and this is a big deal for the nullification crisis, is the American system had things to offer the Northeast. It had things to offer the West in terms of internal improvements. The South really did not have much to gain from this. And so the South, you know, even though Henry Clay says this is in the general interest, the general welfare, all of that, uh, the South, you know, I'll leave it to them to uh, determine their own economic interest. You know, and Calhoun um, said, look, I mean, this system has the South paying the bulk of the taxes because most of these taxes are taxes on imports. So with high, you know, with high tariffs, the South will end up paying more taxes. So we see here that the War of 1812 does result in a more varied economy, but cash crop agriculture is going to drive the United States economy for decades, all the way through the Civil War. Um, so the first two-party system um, is there, the Federalists and the Jeffersonian Republicans, whereas after the War of 1812, because of the Hartford Convention and uh, the things having to do with that, the Federalist Party is no longer a national political force. Um, then we see here the Jeffersonians remaining largely committed to their strict constructionist program, whereas later on, uh, you see that they are more open to um, you know, Hamilton's ideas and Henry Clay. Clay's American system. Revenue tariff, remember, any tariff is a tax on imported goods. A revenue tariff is passed in order to build revenue for the government. No other reason. There is no ulterior motive. So as far as that, uh, you know, so there is no motivation to limit foreign trade. Whereas a protective tariff, and this is why it is so controversial, is that a protective tariff is something that is going to, it is designed not just to raise money for the government, but to protect domestic industry. And protective tariffs are generally high in order order to discourage foreign trade in the sectors that are protected. Now, as far as that uh, that goes here, I I mentioned I get into here. Now, I've got a video on I've got a video lecture on the Missouri Compromise and I also rap with Mr. Betts class. So just make sure if you go to Mr. Betts class on YouTube, um, we did a parody to the tune of Gin and Juice, which uh, is one of my favorite collaborations. Mr. Betts class on YouTube. So just go to uh, youtube.com slash Mr. Betts class and you will find there our little uh, rap collaboration um, is going to be uh, is going to be there. So that's, uh, you know, the link's going to look kind of funny in here. Um, so let's go ahead and just put that there. And so going from here, Henry Clay's American system, I'm noting where the American system was implemented and where there's opposition. So, you know, Jackson definitely not a big fan of the National Bank. So it was brought in, Jackson basically put that to rest. Now the internal improvements, like in, uh, you know, one of the things here, we see the Cumberland Road, which linked Maryland and Illinois with federal funding. Now, a lot of states did internal improvement projects, okay, such as New York's Erie Canal, that was done by the states. Now, James Madison, 
vetoed Calhoun's bonus bill. I sometimes call this Madison's farewell address um, because James Madison vetoes the bonus bill saying that, look, it's, uh, you know, that we, uh, you know, when we look here that, uh, you know, that basically there's no sound foundation of the Constitution. This is one of those rare vetoes where Madison said, hey, I mean, remember, he was the father of the Constitution. He remembered, you know, birthing the Constitution as a little baby, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And like, you know, giving it a bottle. And, you know, Madison's like, no, you can't just say like, oh, well, this is something that provides for the common defense and general welfare, because if we do that, we can basically have anything. Okay. And so Jackson's Maysville Road veto um, is something where, you know, there was this now imagine whose home state is it in? Henry Clay's. It is a, uh, it is a bill that will link like, you know, parts of Kentucky to the Ohio River. And Jackson says, no, the federal government is not going to fund an intrastate internal improvement project. He says, you know, I mean, not in a single state, especially not Henry Clay's state. And after the panic of 1837, you generally don't see funds for internal improvements. And of course, the tariff becomes a very, very, uh, you know, difficult, uh, you know, situation there. And so the American system is never really like fully implemented during this, uh, this time during the antebellum period. And so with that, uh, you know, and noting the, uh, you know, the Monroe Doctrine, which is another, you know, the United States is looking inward, okay? The United States is saying we want to have less of a relationship with Europe, okay? So uh, let's see, just one second. Uh, yeah, so I think I've got that here. Uh, do y'all want to hear a little song? Y'all want to hear a little song? Y'all let me know if y'all want me to sing a little song, okay? Um, so with that, um, oh, okay, Vicky, we are um, actually like state mates. I might have already known that. Um, so with that, um, let me go ahead and, uh, you know, if y'all want to hear a song, y'all let me know in the chat. Uh, now, this is probably more for your teachers than anything because, you know, y'all were, uh, you know, y'all weren't even born like when Adam Sandler uh, you know, Adam Sandler made the song Lunch Lady Land, uh, which it would be worth noting. I would I would definitely go to YouTube and check it out if you've never seen that. Uh, you know, if you've never seen that. And thank you, by the way, um, A Spear X2 started following me on Instagram. So this is just a song that I wrote about Henry Clay's American system. And let me uh, make sure that the camera, I'm sitting down now. So the camera's kind of uh, kind of pointing at me there. All right. So with that, yeah, so yeah, Adam Sandler, it's an, it's an Adam Sandler song here. You know what? I'm just going to, uh, let me stand up here. Okay. So going from there. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let me go ahead and uh, do the song here. All right. Let's see. And I'll probably have to like move things a lot. It's been a while since I've sang it. So, oops. I should have tuned. I should have tuned my guitar first. So, woke up in the morning after a night at the saloon, went to the House of Representatives with my pal John C. Calhoun. This embargo isn't helping us protect ourselves, but it looks like Madison finally listened and now we're in the War of 1812. Turns out we weren't prepared for war as I thought we might have been. The British burned down the White House, much to our chagrin. Well, it ended well at New Orleans. Yeah, that was quite a win. But for our economic future, we need to focus within. 
Well, yesterday's economy was based on foreign trade. If we want to achieve economic independence, then we'll, we'll have it made. Internal improvements, internal improvements. National bank, national bank, national bank. Internal improvements, internal improvements. National bank, protective tariff bill song. So how we have ride some steamy boat, steam, steamy boat, yeah. Steamy boat, steam, steamy boat, steamy boat song. Western roads, west, western roads, yeah. Western roads, west, western roads. Let's see, and then he goes, yeah, well, well, I dreamt one morning that I woke up to see the United States built a national economy. Jimmy signed in the law, a second national bank, supported economic growth, and y'all got him replay to bank. Then internal improvements, bridges, roads, and canals to connect all the sections, gonna make us all pals. A protective tariff to build home industry. Our economy won't have to count on British sympathy. Why cross the Atlantic, travel out of our zone when we can build factories and make stuff right here at home? I know the South's not eager. No, they're not on my side because they grow cotton for the world and they ship it far and wide. In 1828, they said that tariff's too high. John C. turned on me, Carolina nullified. But I said, Calhoun, you've got nothing to fear. Ship your cotton up north and we'll process it here. The American system is pursuing a goal to build a home economy free from foreign control. Let's ride some steamy boats, steam, steamy boats, yeah. Steamy boats, steam, steamy boats, and boats on the western roads, west, western roads, yeah. Western roads, west, western roads. Internal improvements, internal improvements. National bank, national bank, national bank. Internal improvements, internal improvements. National bank, protective tariff rights on steamy boats, steam, steamy boats, yeah. Steamy boats, steam, steamy boats, and boats on western roads, west, western roads, yeah. Eastern roads, west, western roads, and boats on western roads. All right. So anyway, little song uh, about the uh, the American system for you. Hopefully that makes y'all. Now that is on my SoundCloud. If you want to hear that, um, that is on my SoundCloud. So if you go to the SoundCloud, that is uh, that song's there. Um, some of the warm water rap stuff is there. Uh, I've got a compromise of 1850 little warm water rap. Most of the stuff that I've done for warm water is like uh, you know, the uh, the European history stuff. Y'all probably recognize that from uh, Peter the Great. So anyway, with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, I will be back. Now, remember that we are going to, uh, you know, we are going to have, uh, you know, some other sessions, Monday nights at nine o'clock. But remember, Marco Learning Student Support, for those of you who are wanting like some extra, like more in-depth, intensive stuff, um, y'all can use, where was the, uh, I think at another session I had given y'all, I think it's something like Richie 30. Um, if you, you know what, you don't have to pay full price for it. I forget to, I forget that sometimes. Um, if you email support at MarcoLearning.com, um, and I think, I think it's Richie 30. You can try Richie 30. I think that that's the, that that's the, um, discount code, but I forget. Okay. So just, uh, make sure there is a discount code if you're interested in student support. Well, thank you. What is the SoundCloud? Just Google Tom Richie SoundCloud and you'll find it. So anyway, thank y'all very much for, uh, you know, coming and joining me tonight. I will be here again next week to focus on the civil war and reconstruction. So bring your questions and all of that. And I'm looking forward to seeing y'all next week. Uh, you love the number 30. All right. Well, hopefully that works for you. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, it's always a pleasure.